Okay, chapter 23 is on electric current. So when the ends of an electrical conductor, like a metal, are at different electric potentials, charge flows from one end to another. So here's an electric conductor, a wire. This end is held at a higher electric potential, the plus end, and this end is held at a lower electric potential, that's the minus end. And so there's this motion of charge, electric charge, going from the plus towards the minus. So there's a very useful analogy, uh, which is that if you have a high electric potential and you have a natural flow of charge to low electric potential, that's like water flowing from a high pressure to a lower pressure. Okay, so this pipe carries water from the high potential to the lower pressure, and uh, this wire carries uh, charge from the higher potential to lower potential. So continuing with this analogy, if you want to maintain current flow, you need a battery constantly providing a potential difference, and that's called a voltage. Analogously, if you want to maintain this water flow through this pipe, you need to keep adding water here, keeping a high pressure on this end, and pulling the water out of here, keeping lower pressure. You need a pump to do that. So a pump is analogous to a battery to keep the flow going. Current. So when charged particles move, they transfer electric charge from one place to another. That's called electric current or just current. And a conductor is a material that has some free charged particles that can move around. For example, in a metal, negatively charged electrons can move around inside the metal, while the positive nuclei remain fixed in that, that lattice. Okay. Certain types of solid semiconductors have positively charged electron holes which can roam around inside the material. And in liquids, there can be ionic liquids where there's positive or negative ions which can move around inside the liquid carrying, carrying current. So current is a number. Electric current is the rate that charge moves from one point to another. The symbol is I. So if a certain amount of charge, delta Q, moves through this light bulb every amount of time, delta T, then that you divide delta Q by delta T, that's the current. Uh, Charge is measured in coulombs, time is measured in seconds, so the unit of current is coulombs per second. And we have a special name for that, it's called the ampere. One coulomb per second is one amp, with the letter A. Voltage is also a number. Electric potential difference is the same as voltage. So, you have a high voltage here, a plus terminal of a battery is at 1.5 volts, the negative terminal of the battery is at 0 volts. So there is a voltage of 1.5 across this light bulb. If it was no voltage, uh, there'd be no current. And the unit of voltage is volts. So one volt is turns out to be equal to one joule per coulomb. So what we say is that the uh, when a voltage is set up across this light bulb, then the current flows through the light bulb. How does battery work? Well, energy is stored inside a battery in chemical bonds, and when current is flowing through the battery, it disintegrates zinc or lead in this acid, and that adds energy to the current. And then that current has some number of joules per coulomb in it, which get used up in a resistor like a light bulb. So resistance or resistance in a or current in a circuit depends on voltage and resistance. So a resistor is a circuit element, these are all resistors, that use up energy somehow. Either they might make light or sound, or they might just create heat. And no matter what they are, in a circuit diagram you just draw a resistor as a squiggly line. Resistance is also a number. When you apply a voltage across this uh, light bulb, the amount of current that flows through it depends on the resistance, measured in ohms. The symbol for ohm is omega the capital Greek letter omega, and one ohm is one volt per amp. It turns out that the higher the resistance of the object, the less current will flow through it for a given voltage. Some factors that affect the resistance of an object is what it's made out of. Rubber has more resistance than copper. Uh, its shape, so its cross-sectional area, thin wires have more resistance, resistance than thick wires, and Longer wires have more resistance than shorter wires. Ohm's law 
states that the current through an object varies directly proportional to the voltage across it and inversely proportional to the resistance of the object. So in symbol form, it's I equals V over R. So for example, if you have an object with some constant resistance, you double the voltage, you'll double the current. If you double both the resistance and the voltage, the current will remain, will remain the same. You are a resistor, so the human body has some resistance, which depends on what the exact path is of the electricity through your body and whether your hands are wet or dry. So if your hands are kind of sweaty, the resistance between your two hands can be as low as 500 ohms. So imagine you were to grab two broken light bulbs and at some moment this was at plus 120 volts and this one was at zero volts grounding you out. That would be a 120 volts going through, going across your body. And if your resistance is 500 ohms, you can use Ohm's law to solve for the current uh, is 120 volts divided by 500 ohms is 0 0.24 amps, and that'll go right through your heart, which is not a good thing. Electrical current in your body can cause tissue damage, and it can also interfere with the beating of your heart, which is an electrical process. And also, it really, really hurts to get electrocuted. So I want to talk about the direction of, of electron velocity in a metal wire. So what happens when you flip on a switch? But what happens is that establishes an electric field inside a metal wire. So ordinarily electrons are moving all around and randomly bumping against uh, atoms and other electrons like they would in this dashed line. Well once you set up an electric field then this electron as it's moving is always being nudged away from minus and towards plus. Okay? So that motion drift of all these electrons is what we call the current. Actually, we've defined the current as always going from plus to minus. That's the flow of positive charge. But in reality, in a metal wire, the, the drift of velocity of these tiny electrons is actually in the opposite direction. So it's something to keep in mind. DC versus AC. So direct current means that the current is flowing through a wire in one direction only, from the plus to the minus terminal. Alternating current is when the current is going back and forth, back and forth with time. And this is accomplished by actually alternating the polarity of the voltage, so plus, minus, plus, minus. And in North America, all of these power outlets have 60 hertz, plus to minus, plus to minus. And the voltage is 120 volts. Now you can note that power transmission is more efficient if you have higher voltage. So uh, across the Atlantic Ocean and Europe, they tend to use 220 volts as the standard. That's a little more efficient than Canada and the U.S., which continues to use 120 volts just because so much equipment is already installed using 120 volts. It's historical. And it's good to note that your laptop or your cell phone uses DC, so you need a converter when you plug in your laptop or your cell phone, which converts AC in. And there's little diodes in here, which are little one-way valves, which only allow the current in one direction, so you get DC out. Power. Power is the rate at which electricity is used up in the circuit. The equation for power is current times voltage, P equals I times V. The way the units work out is current is measured in amperes, and voltage is measured in volts. An amp is a coulomb per second, and a volt is a joule per coulomb. So when you multiply, the coulombs cancel, and you get joules per second, which is watts. For example, you can solve that if you have a 100 watt light bulb, solve for a current, and the voltage is 120 volts, the current through the light bulb will be 0 0.8 amperes. So circuits can be connected in two main ways, series, in which there's a single pathway for the current, and parallel, in which there's branches, in which the current can flow uh, simultaneously through different paths. So a series circuit has electric current going through one pathway, and the total resistance to the current is the sum of these individual resistances. So here's the plus terminal of a battery, here's a switch, and all these three light bulbs are connected in series. 
And so if one of these bulbs breaks or a switch is open, then no current will flow. A parallel circuit is hooked like this. So here's the plus terminal of the battery. Uh, here's the negative terminal of the battery. Each one of these light bulbs is connected directly to the plus and also directly to the minus. And the current splits up across these different branches. All right, now, this light bulb is, I guess, broken or the switch is open. There's still current that can flow through these two light bulbs and get to the minus of the battery. So break in one path does not interrupt the flow of charge through the other paths. Sort of analogous uh, situation for parallel circuits is lineups at the grocery store. Okay, so it takes time to get through each lineup, but as you add more, uh, more lineups, the lower total resistance of the circuit, since you can go through these different paths. And if one path breaks, if you've got a price check in one aisle, then people can continue through the remaining paths. So that's why. Homes are always wired in parallel. So here's the, the line through your house. You've got 20 amps going this way. Some, maybe 2 amps will go through a lamp. 10 amps will go through a heater. 18 amps go through a toaster. And so that's, that adds up to the total power through this line. When the current through a line is excessive, overheating can result in a fire, which is why we have circuit breakers. A circuit breaker is an automatic switch that turns off when the current exceeds a certain value. And this can prevent fires from occurring. So unlike a fuse, which uh, burns out once, it's uh, once it operates once, a circuit breaker can be reset multiple times. So here's a bunch of switches in, in the basement of my house, each one set to flip off if the current uh, through the line exceeds a certain amount. Okay, chapter 24 is on magnetism. And who doesn't love playing with magnets? Okay, so the term magnetism comes from the name Magnesia, a place on the east coast of Greece where they found lodestones uh, more than 2,000 years ago. These are rocks that you find that have this weird tendency to attract iron filings. They can be used in compasses, and these were used long ago by the Chinese for navigation. So we know that if you have two charged particles separated by some distance, there's an electric force between them. But what you may not know is that if uh, one or more of these charges are moving, you also get a magnetic force between them. This is all part of the theory of electromagnetism. But the electric force and the magnetic force are two different forces in physics, and, uh, and they both exist together if you have charged particles that are moving. So a magnet, like a lodestone for example, must have moving charges within it. In fact, billions of little tiny um, moving charges going in circular, circular paths that give rise to this magnetic force. When that happens, we say that uh, one end is a north pole and the other end is a south pole, N and S. These are called the magnetic poles and every magnet has both of these. So if you've ever played with magnets, you know that sometimes they repel, sometimes they attract. And the rule is that if you have the N pole facing the S pole of two different magnets, then, then opposite poles attract. So these will be uh, pulled towards one another. If you have the S facing the S, you get a repulsive force. And if, if you have the N facing the N, you get a repulsive force. And Magnets always have two poles. There's no such thing as a single uh, magnetic monopole. So a bar magnet has, uh, has poles at either end. If you have a horseshoe magnet like this in a U shape, you have one N side and an S side as well. And the magnetic fields is just this region of magnetic influence surrounding the magnetic, the magnetic poles. And by convention, we say the direction of the magnetic fields away from the, the north poles and then towards the south poles of bar magnets. And the strength of the magnetic field lines uh, is stronger where the lines are closer together and weaker where the lines are further apart. So electrons in orbits can produce magnetic fields, also just electrons spinning. 
And in iron, the main contributor to the magnetic field is actually electron spins. So in most materials, you have electron spins canceling each other out in pairs of uh, up spins and down spins. But in iron, you can have unpaired electron spins that give rise to sort of a net uh, magnetic field. And so neighboring iron atoms do tend to align their unpaired electron spins and so that big regions of iron uh, will all have, have all their spins in the same direction. That's called magnetic domain. But uh, a piece of iron has lots of different domains, each with some random direction of the magnetic field. So a permanent magnet is when you somehow align these magnetic domains, either by placing them in a strong magnetic field or by stroking the iron somehow to align the domains and make a magnet. So here's some unmagnetized iron. All the domains are in random directions. If they start to align a little bit more towards the right than towards the left, then you get an N pole on the right and an S pole on the left. And the, the more they're aligned, the stronger the magnet. And if you cut a, a magnet in half, you end up with two magnets, each with two poles. So in a permanent magnet, uh, the domains are aligned no matter if there's an external magnetic field or not, like this little bug magnet. Uh, in a temporary magnet, like the fridge, it's not a magnet unless it's placed in an external magnetic field. And then, uh, if this is an S pole facing the fridge, then the refrigerator makes an N pole that faces, faces it, and there's an attractive force, which is why fridge magnets always stick to the fridge. They never repel the fridge, because the fridge is a temporary magnet. A compass is a small, permanent bar magnet that is free to rotate about a vertical axis. So the needle, okay, the, the uh, pointy side of a compass, is the end side of that bar magnet. And that will point away from the end side of any other permanent magnet. And that shows the direction of the magnetic field. If you have a current running down through a wire and you surround it with compasses, you'll notice that when the current is running down, all these little compasses point clockwise around the current. If you reverse the current direction, then all the compasses reverse their direction as well. So the electric current is creating a magnetic field. And you can see these magnetic fields if you sprinkle iron filings around current carrying wires. So if you have a current carrying coil of wire or a spiral of wire, that's called an electromagnet. It makes a very strong magnetic field. Uh, this magnetic field strength is increased by the amount of current, the number of turns in the coil, and it can also be increased by putting a piece of iron within the coil. Uh, the magnetic domains in the iron core will, will then align with the magnetic field that you, that you produce with the electromagnet and increase the strength. That's what they use in this junkyard electromagnet. They can turn on the magnet, and there's iron in there, and so it can pick up pieces of metal. Electromagnets can also be used to levitate trains. You have electromagnets in the track of this, uh, in the train tracks here, and then you have permanent magnets in the train, and they, the coils are meant to repel and then pull. And so can also can not only lift the train but can also propel it along. And you can also have superconducting electromagnets that uh, can produce very strong magnetic fields and do it economically because there's no heat losses due to resistance in the wires. So a magnetic, sorry, an electric current in an an external magnetic field will feel a force. That's also called the magnetic force. And it's perpendicular both to the magnetic field, which in this case is from N to S, and to the charged particle velocity, which is, I guess, along this uh, current carrying wire. So it would be maybe up or down, I think, in this case. So electric current moves through a magnetic field. It experiences this deflecting force, which is perpendicular to both the magnetic field and to the current, and the force is strongest when the current is perpendicular to the magnetic field lines. So here's the current, here's perpendicular to that is the magnetic field, 
and perpendicular to that is the force, either up or down, depending on the direction of the current. A galvanometer is a current indicating device, which determines the current in a wire by measuring the magnetic force that's due to a permanent magnet. This is called an ammeter, because it measures amps. You can also take this same thing, hook it up in, um, in parallel across the circuit, and use it to measure volts, and that is called a voltmeter. If you take a galvanometer and you cleverly switch the current direction every time it makes half a rotation, and you can, can, instead of just turning a dial when there's an electric current through it, you can make the dial go round and round and round, and this can, uh, can drive a car, I guess, or something, and this is what's actually called an electric motor. That's how an electric motor works. You get continuous rotation. So the Earth itself is a huge magnet. There's a magnetic field, even just uh, due to the uh, nature of the Earth. Okay. Magnetic poles of the Earth are at the North and South Poles. One's up in Canada, one's down in Antarctica. And it's due to electric currents, we think, inside the iron core of the Earth. And there's geological evidence that the Earth's magnetic field reverses direction. Um, and has done so about 20 times in the last 5 million years. So out in space, there's many charged particles moving along, and that can be hazardous to astronauts. It's a form of radiation. But these cosmic rays are deflected away from Earth by the Earth's magnetic field. So this is partly protecting us from radiation. And these are the Van Allen radiation belts, where the radiation is trapped. Well, we're down here safe on the surface of the Earth. So storms in the sun can hurl a lot of these uh, cosmic rays or charged particles towards the Earth, and they can get trapped in the uh, Van Allen radiation belts, and sometimes they even dip down into, into the Earth's atmosphere and glow. And that's called aurora borealis, or if it's in the northern hemisphere, or aurora australis, it's in the southern hemisphere. 